Well, I think it tells us, Bev, that the Chinese government has decided to give us uh, enough concessions which act as an anaesthetic, by which I mean high-level political contact is resumed, normal political uh, meetings and summitry and all the rest. Uh, trade bans are being uh, progressively withdrawn, so we're getting export dollars back again, a few billion extra. Uh, but that, that is enough in, the, in Beijing's estimation to, uh, if you like, buy us off, anaesthetise us to the pain so that we're not going to complain too much when it continues to do on the high seas and in the air what it's been doing to the Australian armed forces for two years and has been doing to other countries' uh, armed forces for much longer. And that is uh, these dangerous encounters uh, which are reckless, recklessly conducted showing that the Chinese military has a higher tolerance for risk than any other countries, prepared to risk accidents and incidents, potentially deadly ones, uh, the, the policy being uh, designed to force everyone else's militaries back. Now, this is only the third dangerous uh, encounter that we've found out about from our government between Australia and China in the last two years. But last month, the Americans uh, put out a, a statement cataloguing 180 what they just what the US described as dangerous encounters with the Chinese Air Force and the US Air Force over the last two years. Uh, and they do it routinely with the Japanese, with the Taiwanese and the Filipinos, the Vietnamese, the Malaysians. Uh, so we're not being singled out for special treatment. Uh, this is a continuum of Chinese policy. And the, the good stuff that we've just been given, as I say, designed to anesthetize us so we don't make too much of a fuss about uh, what this policy is leading to, which is ultimately designed to be the uh, effortless or the, or should I say, low cost exercise of hegemony by China over the entire Indo-Pacific. At the same time, you know, the Prime Minister has been criticised for not divulging any private conversation he might have had with President Xi. While we can see that China is still fully on course with those ambitions that you've just laid out, is there some sort of tacit agreement between the two sides that both can state their own claims. On the Australian side, uh, the good news is that the government wasn't intimidated uh, or bought off into silence and publicised this incident. That's how we know about it. The Australian government put out a press statement. Uh, the Chinese side, of course, denies that any such thing happened. Uh, what the opposition is concerned about is the fact that Albanese won't say clearly in public that, yes, I took the opportunity of meeting with Xi Jinping to rebuke him or to protest about China's uh, dangerous and unprofessional conduct at sea with the Royal Australian Navy. Uh, but Albanese's position is a, is a tricky one because he's saying, well, it wasn't a formal bilateral where you have the full a panoply of officials and you have a communicate this as a, a casual pull aside. But he does say, and this is very deliberate, he does say, but we have communicated our displeasure uh, through every normal channel. Well, that includes the legal level. The code there he's telling us is that he did raise it with Xi Jinping, but he doesn't want to say it plainly and bluntly on the public record because he wants to draw a contrast between himself and Scott Morrison, who famously got in trouble for leaking text messages he'd exchanged with the president of France, uh, Macron, and various uh, other adventures. So uh, I think Albanese is telling us that the Australian government has done everything it can. Uh, the problem is not so much, I think, an agreement as a lack of agreement, and that is uh, nothing is, is deterring or uh, nor has any country yet figured out how to deter or prevent these dangerous and potentially life-threatening incidents uh, of friction against the Chinese Navy and Air Force. Yeah. At the same time, we saw China go last week, uh, Xi Jinping go to, to the US. He had to also do, you know, to, to get some concessions there because of the, the, the state of the relationship. China wants to play a role on the global stage, but has it still got to be very much on their terms? They've weighed into the Israel-Gaza conflict, they've weighed into the Ukraine conflict. Um, but do they see themselves as a really alternate global power? Absolutely. Absolutely they do. And that is exactly, uh, there's, there's lots, there's a whole paper trail of evidence in speeches by Xi Jinping over the last decade. Uh, it, it, to sum up, one of his favourite aphorisms is that the East is rising, the West is declining. Um, he has set up uh, global initiatives, the most famous of which and the longest standing of which is the Belt and Road Global Infrastructure Plan, 
which to date has uh, dispersed a trillion US a trillion US dollars worth of infrastructure around the world. But he's since laid out uh, fairly recently a global security initiative yet to be fully fleshed out and a global civilization initiative. And these are all designed uh, to be the infrastructure for a new Chinese dominated world order. Plus there are many smaller uh, elements as well. But yes, he absolutely sees uh, China as constructing a new global order dominated by China. Uh, and you, you know, his very first speech as general secretary of the Chinese Communist Party 11 years ago now, he said, I will put China and, and we should, you know, we should have learned from the Vladimir Putin invasion of Ukraine. We should take what these guys say seriously because they, these autocrats flag their intentions and they flag their aggression and ambitions. And he said, I will put China in a position to take the initiative and exercise dominance, not dominance over, you know, the East China Sea, the South China Sea, dominance. And, you know, when you're talking about Putin as, a, as an example, and uh, we've got the, the, the war in Ukraine grinding on, some are assessing this as a complete stalemate. Is that your view of what's happening at the moment as the world's focused is completely, of course, now on uh, Israel and Gaza? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm sure that uh, Volodymyr Zelensky is feeling a little bit overlooked at the moment because after what appeared to be a, a really uh, a set stalemate between the Russians and the Ukrainians, the Ukrainians did achieve a breakthrough in the last week, but nobody noticed, or very few people noticed, because global media attention is very much focused on Israel and Gaza. But uh, what, what the uh, Ukrainians managed to achieve uh, was to break a stalemate that had existed for almost exactly a year, and that is where the uh, Ukrainians were able to take back from Russia the only regional capital that Russia had seized in, in this offensive, which is the city of Kherson. But, uh, and that had driven the Russians right up to the bank of the Dnipro River, and the, the Russians had been forced to cross the river to escape. And after a year of stalemate, the Ukrainians have now managed to cross that river, which is 10 kilometres wide. That's a difficult and dangerous approach to make against a heavily dug in and armed enemy. But they managed to cross it established bridgeheads on the on the, the side uh, occupied by Russia and forced the Russians back, according to what Kiev is telling us yesterday, by between three and eight kilometres from uh, the eastern bank of the Dnipro River. Well, that's a major breakthrough. And from there, the Ukrainian ambition is to fight its way all the way through to Crimea, the, the prize uh, piece of uh, Ukrainian territory that Russia took in 2014. That's a major breakthrough. It's just that not many people have noticed, but you can be sure Vladimir Putin's noticed. Indeed, and, and, and I suppose, too, something that we have to be mindful of not to forget, um, uh, while, uh, of course, th there is so much more occupying us. Good to talk, as always, Peter. Thank you so much. Pleasure, Bev.